Ian Mitchell, welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. Thanks, Nick. Happy to be here, man. Yeah, me too. And I am down south of the border with bad Wi-Fi and lots of wind and background noises. So this is a priority and I wanted to make it happen at all costs. I sincerely appreciate that. Yeah, I'm in a very chilly Tulsa, Oklahoma at the moment. (laughs) Well, let's start this one off on a different, a more unusual note than I usually do. And that is, what's a controversial idea or stat or something like that that will begin our conversation about the quantum and consciousness and spirituality and the science behind all of this? Um, well, one of the things that it, typically, this is something that I, I probably disagree with most people on. I think most people think that consciousness stems, you know, you have a physical form and then consciousness is something that is the outcropping of that kind of like, you know, Arthur C. Clarke had this concept of inorganic unconscious becomes, uh, un, you know, organic unconscious, which then becomes organic conscious, which then ultimately results in inorganic unconscious, you know, say, say like pr- rocks to primordial soup to us, to artificial intelligence. And I, I don't actually approach it like that. My take is that, um, we're more of an outcropping of consciousness instead of the other way around. You don't have physicality and then consciousness, you have consciousness, which then necessitates physicality. And so that's, I would say that's a a definitively different take than most kind of going from right to left in lieu of left to right. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that same note, then what so far have you done for your health, your performance, your bioharmony and spirituality? Um, spent, uh, decades and decades meditating. I think that uh, that's probably the the biggest thing. When I was a kid, I had massive headaches, I, very heavy duty migraines starting from ages nine through 11. And, you know, my parents couldn't find anything wrong. I had all the CAT scans, PET scans, nobody could find anything. So on a whim, my dad said, let's put him in biofeedback theory, therapy. And so I started doing real heavy duty rounds of biofeedback and neurofeedback as a little kid. And that was pretty transformative. And, and, and I had already, you know, when I was, I think seven or so, I got my first mantra. And so I had already kind of been moving in that direction. And then in my early twenties, I started meditating very heavily. And that was kind of a a core concept, you know, for my entire existence. And what I noticed is sort of an outcropping of that was there was a radical shift in my own capacity to do different things, to understand different things. Um, Not just in terms of the insights that I'd gleaned, but also, just in terms of the sheer raw processing power, there was a, a very radical shift. You know, I, I needed to do some stuff in the lab the other day, and I had to memorize a 72-digit string of numbers. And that's, you know, when I was younger, that would have been an impossibility. You know, and I know those things are trainable, but I didn't actually have to train in order to do that. You know, and I think, I think in effect, the, the repeated practice of doing some sort of diligent meditative exercise over consistent decades of trial and error and then continuing to do it. Um, I think that actually does become the, the sort of the exercise, right? It gives you, it grants you different capacities. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I arrived at this point. Yeah. And so for those listening in, Ian has a nice cool lab behind him, some fancy gear. And it sounds like you were not born a crazy bad scientist in the best of ways or a researcher, but you built and developed those skills. Yeah, I did. But you know, when, when I was a kid though, I mean, truth be told, I think you kind of have uh, you have a certain resonance when you're born and mine, when I was a kid, my mom jokes now that I've just come back to doing what I always did because I literally would fill our refrigerator with things that I called dissolve, which was just, I would mix different chemicals and compounds and had, you know, had back in the day when you could get these, when I was a kid, you could get these really hardcore chemistry sets that had things that you would never be able to buy now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, not without ending up on some terrorist watch list. <laughs> so, you know, guys in dark suits with dark glasses would be rolling in if you bought this stuff. But when I was a kid, you could buy that kind of stuff, you know, like, oh, look, mail order shotguns. Sure. Why not? You know, um, titanium powder. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the earlier things I remember doing was when I was a little kid, uh, you know, making gunpowder, right. You know, and just, and you could literally just buy all the compounds to make huge amounts of gunpowder. So I would make gunpowder and play with things. And then 
also building lasers, you know, you used to be able to get all the, all the stuff to do that, you know, pretty heavy duty lasers. There weren't quite as many requirements because it was sort of a cutting edge thing. Now, if you wanted to build you know, like a megawatt laser, people would be taking notice. I remember I experimented with a lot of that stuff when I was a kid too. It was probably just about when it was starting to become illegal, borderline gray area. And I had the, was it the milliwatt laser? And I remember that it was like you need to wear special safety goggles. You need to be careful where you shine it. You don't want to shine it up in the, yeah, exactly the ones you're holding. You don't want to shine it in anywhere that a plane could see it, or even like your neighbors if they don't have protective glasses on. And it's a whole world. It's like little kids probably shouldn't have this kind of access, but it was fascinating nonetheless. Yeah, it, it truly was. That's actually funny because I really do. These are laser protective glasses, and this is a medical grade laser next to me that we we use when we do stem cell work in here. So let's talk now about the quantum. That's a term that people have probably heard, and maybe they have a experimented with quantum products, or they're skeptical of quantum products, rightfully so, because there's a lot of snake oil in the industry. But can you explain what the quantum is like for like a lay person so that it's clear and then also how you can influence the quantum? Okay, so those are pretty intense. Um, qu quanta is just basically the smallest measurable portion of something is a quanta. So in, the, in this sense, you know, there's, there's quantum mechanics and quantum physics. And in the, in the sense that you and I are talking about it, it's, you know, because we've talked offline before, we're really addressing quantum biology. Right. And and the thing that's kind of the most present in, in quantum biology is the idea that things are connected. Right. Quantum quantum entanglement. And so we've been doing a lot of experiments um, to suss out the the idea that things are, in fact, entangled and that you can elicit a response with different particles remotely. Now, they've been able to do that, you know, in, in physics for a while and have gotten pretty good separations in terms of distance between, you know, when, when one atom will move this way or one electron will move this way and looking at the counter rotation spin. And, and that's pretty well known, pretty validated, but it's usually thought of that, you know, you, you don't elicit those sort of states unless you're, you know, like quantum computing, you get, you've got everything crunched down and you're using liquid helium or, you know, something like that to really drop the temperatures to almost absolute zero. So you can stabilize it. And then you can elicit those effects. We're kind of hot, gooey, wet masses. And so people don't really think of, you know, like, oh, we can get all these quantum states. Well, as it turns out, nature already kind of figured out how that worked and does it all the time. So what I've been doing is going back into the laboratory and at one of the universities where I, where I do a lot of my research. And we've been developing experiments so that we can show that we can elicit specific effects on different cells, different cell cultures, um, different things like ATP output and do it remotely. Honestly, it's kind of fascinating for me because what we've been able to very demonstrably show is, yes, you can elicit a consistent response 100% of the time by, by, and actually our distance has been about 10,000 miles and which is remarkable, right? And so we've been, we've been running these things where we're actually specifically looking at ATP output in different cell cultures. And so we will do a double blinded version of a study where I'm the only person who knows which cells are which, uh, the guys in the lab who are incubating them, and then the guys who are running the ATP assays to look at you know what's coming out um, when you use like cell titer glow to, to get that in a luminometer and you and you pull the, the levels out so you can see the ATP presence. Those guys have no idea which is which. I'm the only guy who actually knows. And then the guys who are charging the stuff remotely from Germany in this case, all I do is send them a picture of the cells. So they're blinded in terms of knowing which ones they are. And it's remarkable to me because repeatedly every single time with perfect efficacy, it's it's shifting. So, you know, you take the baseline levels to see what the output is on the ATP in this case before you treat them. Then you treat them. Then we do time point interval testing at 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, eight hours, and then 24 hours. Every single time you see an uptick in the ATP output when people are trying to enhance the cellular production from some remote position and it's just it's still even though i'm there and i'm i'm the guy getting the data and looking at it and knowing what's going on it's boggling to me that that is in fact the case i mean it very demonstrably shows like hey don't exactly know how it works yet we haven't you know meted out or sussed out exactly what's transpiring but it's obviously transpiring and the thing that's great to me about that is that's really kind of the the edge of where the science is 
when you take the, the basic precepts that you've been able to learn and you start applying them and you, and you develop it out and you go, okay, well, does it work? Yeah. It works hundred percent of the time. Cool. How does it work? No clue. Right. You know, we, and, and in fact, I think in some cases it's a little difficult because we're kind of, uh, you know, we're large meaty creatures. We, we don't really have the capacity to necessarily look at the primary mover in these cases. So, you know, we're, we're looking at ATP, right? So I can see that the ATP shifts every time, but I don't know, is it, you know, is it, I can drill down maybe another level and say, let's look at the specific complexes in the electron transport chain and see, you know, using something like rotenone or something like modulate little different tweaks to it. So I could isolate which complex in the electron transport chain is up in. Then we can maybe go a level below that and do a high degree of scrutiny. But beyond that, it's honestly, it's kind of nature's black box at this point. We don't actually have the capacity to really see uh, using, you know, the, the equipment that we have at present, what's really transpiring. That's really the beauty of science is it's not just asking the questions and memorizing the stuff and all the rote learning that passes off for education now. It's actually taking the concepts that you have, finding the things that don't fit, and then pulling that thread to say, okay, what's happening here? What I would always tell my students is science is a point on a line. The best science that we have now will seem absolutely boneheaded to people a thousand years from now. Medical doctors, the best medical doctors 400 years ago appear as if barbaric to people who are practicing, you know, cutting edge surgery now. And the same thing applies. Like we can be really brilliant and doing our best thing in the beginning of the 21st century. You know, fast forward a thousand years, they're going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> like, what were you guys thinking? You know, hopefully they, you know, they have some uh, kind of compassion and go like, well, they did the best with what they could. But it's like you and I, you know, offline, we're talking about Nikola Tesla, you know, in the, uh, I think it was the IEEE convention in 1914, he was talking about how in the future, people would be able to see one another and communicate in real time around the world. And he got lambasted, right? Because the technology was so far outside of the realm of anything that people believe to be possible. You just got hammered. And, you know, fast forward a hundred years, we all have cell phones. You and I, you know, are in remote places in the country or two countries as it were going back and forth real time with video. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of time, but that's, that to me is science, right? Being, being at the very edge and doing the work to figure out what don't I understand, right? There's a lot of things we do understand, but there's a whole lot of stuff we don't understand. And rather than go, well, this makes no sense. It can't possibly be right, you know, and just walking away. That's not what I want to do. That's why the quantum is really neat to me because it's an entire field where, you know, we've, we've done a bunch of blood work trying to get quantum effects on things. And we can show, and I'll, I'll send you some pictures so you can put them up. We can show that very demonstrably there is a shift over just a few minutes in the way the blood aggregates and coalesces, right? You know, you, do, you don't get the same, same sort of shift. Uh, it's almost as if you have clotting factors in one and an absence of clotting factors in another. You know, you can look at, you know, the PTI timing and, and different things and see, see really radical shifts that honestly almost makes no sense because you're like, well, there's no electromagnetic fields. There's no electrical fields. There's no magnetic field interaction. It's remote what's happening. And and that's what I love though, you know, like what is happening? We've got to figure it out. Yeah. So in those experiments, when you were blinded, you did a properly controlled trial, luckily, and only the researchers, actually the researchers didn't know, you knew, and you sent them over a photo. What were they doing to that photo? Were they just putting intention into it? Yeah, effectively. Yeah. It's placing intention into the photos. So you know, this is, they look at those cells and part of it is one of the precepts of all of this is that there's an overarching kind of, if you will, a collective intelligence that we're almost like uh, remote terminals on a giant system, right? And so as a, as a small terminal, we can tap into the larger terminal, upload our request, and then that request gets executed on. And there has to be some sort of overarching intelligence that governs a lot of that. Now that's one theory, right? That's that's kind of the precept that we're running with. Is that the case? I don't know that we'll ever actually be able to prove that out one way or the other. You know, uh, I can tell you that matter of factly, the data sets work and and we get the result. 
but I don't actually know if that's the right, you know, I mean, you can get the right result and have a completely incorrect hypothesis. So, you know, we're, we're getting the right result, but maybe completely wrong about why what's happening is happening. Yeah. And on the quantum biology front, for a long time, there was a theory that the receptors worked via a lock and key mechanism. And is that no longer the case? No, well, it's still, there's, there's still conjecture about that, but I can tell you matter of factly, and I can do experiments that prove it over and over remotely that olfaction and gustation, just smell and taste are vibratory functions. They are not mechanistic functions. Now that's not to say that there isn't a mechanistic component. Uh, some of the work that I did with Leela Quantum, uh, I was on stage doing a presentation about a year ago, and there, there's video online of this. You've probably seen this one because I, I had referenced it in a previous lecture that you were at, where I took someone who had a really horrible shellfish allergy, and I opened a can of crab on stage. I derma rolled their arm, and then I put the, the juice from the crab on their arm. And, it, and as would be expected, just like an old dermal stamp test for an allergist, instant histamine reaction, puffing, swelling, redness, itching. And then I put it in a thing called the Quantum Block, which is one of the companies that I work with is Leela Quantum. And they just have these static sheets of metal. And I put the crab meat in and then I discussed waveforms and kind of talked about how, you know, when, when I ask a person to think of a wave, they generally think of something like this, right? And, th and that's because that's what we're taught. But in reality, that's not how waves function. They're actually in more of a spherical thing that's got a rotation and a pressure and a gradient and a spin and probably 18 different components I could prattle off off the top of my noggin that isolate what's really happening with a wave that's, you know, multidimensional. That's not something that's just, you know, like an old school oscilloscope from the 1920s. Prattled on about that for a couple of minutes. And then I took it out. I derma rolled his other arm with a new derma roller. And then I put the, the crab juice on that side and nothing happened. There's no histamine reaction. And that literally everyone in the audience came up to the stage after the, the presentation was over and looked at his arms because it was so anomalous because you're used to saying, oh, well, I have an allergy to X substance. So if I use X substance, I'm going to react a certain way. That's true. But all of those substances are, if you look below the atomic level and then below the subatomic level, everything has a vibratory component, right? There's a resonant frequency for everything. And what you're really having a reaction to with a histamine reaction isn't so much the tangible physical components. It's kind of, if you will, the way that things vibrate, whether it's constructive or destructive interference from the frame of what's cascading up to become concrete, right? So something that actually is, is becoming manifest in a 3D space. And if you modulate things on the levels below that, well, then when it cascades up, it's going to smooth it out. So rather than having a destructive interference, you negate that destructive interference and it's more coherent and more prone to having constructive interference. So they don't have the same reaction. That's my hypothesis. And I've been able to test it. I've been able to retest it, verify it and repeat it many, many times. And it always works that way. But again, we don't actually have the tech to see what's really happening at that quantum level. So can I 100% verify that? No. I can say that I can do it, it's repeatable, and every time the experiment turns out that way. But again, it's it's at a stratum that's so subtle that we really kind of are in effect at this point, you know, running blind because we don't have the technological capacity to view things at that fine scale. It seems like these days there's more and more technologies and tools that work not on the physical I don't even know the, the word for it. They don't work via your traditional like substance. You ingest it and it causes like chemical reactions within the body, within the cell. But it works on like an elect electromagnetic or some other way. And it seems like underneath that, as you were mentioning, it causes a like vibrational change within the body that like kind of bypasses the typical steps that you take when you ingest a compound. Is that like a right way of thinking about it that when you use these certain technologies and the quantum things, whatever it is, that you're just going to the core level and you're working on that pathway within, within the body rather than going in order like the way it's typically done? I think it is because I think what what's really transpiring here is you're conveying information, whether you convey that information with a chemical, right? Because a chemical is in effect a structure and structures are capable of conveying information in terms of shapes. Think of, oh, I don't know, say every language ever. 
right? You know, those, those are, those are all, you know, every representation is a shape that's intended to convey some sort of information, right? So when you go below that, you can say, well, even, you know, oral traditions, that's all a specific vibration grouped in a specific cluster, which is a shape, if you will, you know, to convey a, a specific set of information. So it would stand to reason that rather than have to use the chemical compound, which is the tangible physical representation of that information, if you can kind of cut to the chase and instead of handing somebody a piece of paper with the words written down, you just tell them what's going on. That's, you know, a more effective way to do it. But you can even go a little bit beyond that. You know, I mean, everybody I think who's listening to this will have at one point or another had the very far-fetched thing of having a dream. And, you know, when you go to sleep at night, everybody dreams, right? And in a dream, most people will have had the experience of finding themselves in a circumstance where you instantly have a knowing about what the entire environment is, right? Like, you know, the people that are at play, you didn't just show up and, and have to get introduced and have all of this, you know, the backstory, you don't need to, you know, have the prequel, uh, you suddenly just have an awareness. And I, and I also think that in terms of the subtle nature of things, you can have the gross physical part, then you can have the more subtle part that's energetic. And then you can even just have, you know, parts that are lower than that. Like you don't have to have it written down. Somebody doesn't have to say it verbally. You just suddenly know it. And I think those are kind of correlates to having physical manifestations, having, you know, energetic manifestations, and then having something on a quantum level. I agree with your kind of supposition there. And I think it's gradations, right? We're just getting more and more and more and more refined. You know, if you, if you try to have this conversation about what was causing illness, say, you know, 600 years ago, pre von Leeuwenhoek, before they had the microscope and could actually image things, like if you had walked up and said, I think it's tiny bugs that are coming inside you and attacking you, and then they're spreading, you know, people would have been like, you're an effing nutter. What are you on about? But then Von Leeuwenhoek, you know, pops up with like, hey, turns out there are all these little tiny bugs that are getting inside you and replicating. If you look at it from that lens, the stuff that we now take for granted 600 years ago would have been laughable. They actually probably would have burned you or, you know, or, or something worse. Yeah. You told me in our previous conversation about some experiments that you do or you show people that convince them that there's something there and there's actually like validity to the quantum. And one had to do with coffee. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that that one is uh, it's it's a it's a pretty simple thing. And it actually it goes back towards uh, the idea of olfaction and gustation not being physical effects with the old, you know, the old school kind of lock and key method but being something that's governed vibratory nature. And so uh, you simply don't touch the coffee or anything like that. You have, you have a person take the coffee and separate it into two cups and you don't touch it, but then you change the frequency in one of the cups and it tastes entirely different. And it's so repeatable. And I've done it with, you know, one of my friends is a professor at Harvard. I did it with him. And I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I guess it's got to be vibratory, right? And I said, yeah, that's exactly it. You know, he was, he was very quick to, to pace up to the idea that, hey, just because we can't see it, if you can change the vibratory nature of something, it's going to change some of the properties. And so it's a, it's a very simple experiment. It's very repeatable. And I, and I like that one because when you're doing this kind of as a mental abstraction and you're telling people about it, it's difficult when they can actually see it real time and taste it and smell it, they kind of go, Oh, okay. So what I consider to solely be a physical compound actually has a vibratory component that when modulated makes the physical portion taste and smell different. And it's just because, because they're able to perceive it with their own senses, it takes the idea of, quantum, which is very, you know, very, very difficult uh, for people to, to grasp. And I always tell people, yeah, seriously, when you hear people prattle on about quantum in terms of marketing, be wary, right? Because m most of the time it's like, uh, we sell quantum peanut butter for 25 times what we sell normal peanut butter for. It's total bunk. When you can make it tangible and practical for people and they can actually personally smell it and taste it, it drives the point home that, Yes, there is definitively more going on than we would have thought is transpiring in this arena. To me, it's just it, you kind of open the door a little bit so that people aren't so reluctant um, and staunchly reserved about everything. They'll go, OK, well, fair enough. You know, and, and, I, and I'm the first person to say it and be very open about it. 
we really can't define all of those things because they're too subtle right now. Taking pot shots around, you know, probably, hopefully, you know, tertiary, quaternary kind of things, the third and fourth things down the line. But the primary movers there, I don't know that in my lifetime we'll, we'll ever actually be able to really suss that out, you know. It, it's kind of like the equivalent of von Leeuwenhoek hoping for a gas chromatograph. I'm sure he had the idea. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure people listening to this will hear you say that you just changed the frequency or you modulated it. What were you actually doing, Ian? This is one of the kind of the more esoteric things. Uh, but, you know, when you spend 30 something years meditating, you, you're bound to hit some sort of esoteric things. Actually, all you're doing is focusing a specific emotion on it. And the more capable you are of eliciting that specific emotion, the more of an impact you'll have, right? The clearer your channel. And so the the easiest one that I've personally found is love, you know, for, for better or worse. That's just the truth of the matter is you focus love on something and it changes it. Now, it, it's kind of funny to me because you always hear people talk about like their mom's cooking, like, oh, she made it with love. It tasted better. Well, actually, as it turns out, it's kind of true. <laughs> so, you know, or or maybe if not tasted better objectively, subjectively, a very definitive possibility that since it's focused for that person, it is actually a subjective experience and not everybody would perceive it the same way. And that has to, I mean, as a scientist, you have to be open to the possibility that sometimes it might seem just really ridiculous because you, you're having that collapsing of a waveform. You know, it becomes a particle at some point and you you cease to be in the domain of Heisenberg rather and, and move into Schrodinger. So, you know, you go from something that's abstract in Heisenberg's equations where you, you, you can't pinpoint it both at the same point, And then you collapse the waveform via Schrodinger's equations, say, there it is. Before we go on to that, I think that's an important thing to bookmark, because if you've looked into the quantum at all, you'll come across Heisenberg. And it'd be nice if you could explain that in brief in a second, but more on the application side, when you say that you just focus love on it, are you like feeling the love in your body and then transmitting it through like your hands or energy field into the object? Effectively, yeah. And so I don't actually have to be present to do it. I mean, I've done it with people on the other side of the planet, which again, I know it sounds like an outlandish claim and you know, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's one thing, if you're going to be honest, you're going to be honest, period. So yeah, I, I'm aware that it sounds like a very outlandish and bizarre claim, but that's just the nature of it. I mean, you do that and focus love on the object and then it changes the object. We know definitively in, in quantum physics, when you observe something, you change it. So that's not really that different. Again, that's, you know, the collapsing of the waveforms. I think when it becomes macroscopic in scale, it starts to freak people out because it seems very outside of the norm. And admittedly, I, I know it's very outside of the norm. I don't know if it's just something that, you know, an outcropping of spending 30 years meditating that allows some different capacity or who knows, maybe it was I ate Wheaties that day. I really don't know. But it's repeatable, consistently repeatable over and over and over and at distance, which is one of the more interesting things to me is that the distance doesn't really matter. My personal philosophy on that, which is probably a little bit more woo-woo than, than most scientific approaches, is that everyone and everything are connected. And, you know, if you don't think that you're having an impact on everyone and everything consistently all over the place, you're just kidding yourself, right? You know, when you start the day and you move out the first person that you bump into, if you can kind of elicit some positive, happy response in them, it propagates a wave that is beneficial for everyone everywhere. It might be small, but it's still beneficial. And I think personally that that's something that's consistent throughout all of life. That impact translates over and over. And, and in fact, the more you do it and the more sort of a beacon of positivity you become, I think the, the more in alignment you are and the easier it is to do it over and over and over. You know, for me, that meditation was like that. It was because you know, I did transcendental meditation. I think I started doing it now. It's a little bit over 30 years ago. At first, it was very difficult to kind of have that transcendent sort of experience where you sort of dip out and everything goes away. After decades of doing it, it's something that you drop into so quickly. But again, it's practiced. And I think 
harnessing love and compassion and positivity and, and the emotions that are kind of on the, the pleasant side of the spectrum that are going to benefit people. I think that actually too is kind of a muscle, right? Like, you know, I was in a horrible motorcycle wreck 13, 13 weeks ago yesterday. My femur ended up inside of my tibia, right? So the femoral condyle punched through the tibial condyle, went down one inch and split the tibia straight down six inches, admittedly. And I face planted at 65 miles an hour. So that's, you know, both of those are not so thrilling in terms of the outcroppings and the, you know, the orthopedic surgeon, when I was in the ER said, oh, this is a horrible injury. We're going to have to put you back together with plates and pins and screws. And it's going to be 12 weeks before you can put any pressure whatsoever on your leg. And, and it was, it was just kind of this doom and gloom thing. And I said, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to pass. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Got myself discharged from the hospital and set up a hospital bed at my lab and just rehabbed everything. It's kind of funny because that was literally 13 weeks and a day ago. Um, actually, not even a full day, 13 weeks and a few hours ago. And I shouldn't have been able to walk or with it, put any pressure on my leg until last week. And I'm, you know, I'm bopping around walking and have been for weeks. You know, I rehabbed it to the point of having having new bone growth and, that, and r tr truly radiographic healing where you could actually see the bone growth after a week, um, which was kind of dumbfounding to the orthopedic surgeon since I had passed on the surgery. And miraculously, everything repositioned itself into the proper position, which was just one of those, you know, like strange occurrences. And I don't know that that would be the, the case for everybody, but you know, I'm happy to share the x-rays. It's just, you know, I can't say why it did what it did, but everything worked out really, really well. Yeah. Well, that's an incredible story in itself. And I'm sure there was a big portion of your day spent meditating and focusing on the fields around your body. But what else were you doing to get that incredible result? So pulsed electromagnetic field work, I used PEMF coils, uh, specifically from a company called Pulse Centers, because I, I think their product is really good. And it creates a very high intensity field. So I did pulsed electromagnetic fields, uh, laser therapy, infrared therapy. I used topicals like comfrey, some traditional things, you know, or knit bone, I think as it's called uh, colloquially. Let's see, I did very small embryonic like stem cell procedures. Uh, I did six, six of those rather in seven weeks where I would harvest PRP and then spin it down and then use lasers to activate the V-cells and then re-inject the V-cells. Uh, so it, pretty pretty intense work. Yeah, I definitively meditated and did all that kind of stuff, but that's kind of a substrate that I would have been doing anyway. So you know, the, the other components were very additive. I think personally, I think the probably the top three things that made a difference were the lasers, the pulsed electromagnetic fields, and then some of the nanoparticulate supplements because they drop out inflammatory response and they upregulate ATP production intracellularly, which is when you have a really bad injury like that, you're trying to hasten the pace that all your cells are compensating and buffering everything and regrowing. And then the pulsed electromagnetic field works, they kind of upregulate the osteoblastic formation where you're starting to pump out new uh, trabeculae and make new bone and get better ossification. And it happens more rapidly. Those were the biggies. But it, you know, proofs in the pudding. I actually kind of looked at it as like a, huh, well, I can either get bummed out about the fact that I just got destroyed, or I can use it as an opportunity to try and play with myself and do some experimentation and see what works. And, and you know, truly proofs in the pudding, right? So I was back up in a couple of weeks working and walking and doing things as opposed to the prognosis <laughs> via the normal establishment of, you know, 12 weeks before you can put any pressure on that thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things I want to dig into there. The first is the supplements you mentioned. You said something about a nanoparticulate, was it? So a lot of the things that I take every day are based with carbon-60, which is a nanoparticle that's it's Buckminster Fullerene. It's basically, it's, it's a 60 carbon atoms clustered together in a truncated icosahedron, also lovingly known as a soccer ball. When you bind them to a fat, you can, you can do kind of this weak molecular reduction to a fat and it allows them to move transmembranally. So they'll, they'll move through the, the cell membranes and then they delocalize and they move towards the, uh, the mitochondrial membrane and they embed in the mitochondrial membrane and they knock out oxidative stress load. And there's some really good NIH papers that you can read on that. And there's actually, at this point, there's been a lot of study on it. That's kind of a, a core component because I did two clinical trials in dogs using that compound and saw just a tremendous decrease in cytokines in the first two hours. So you get just this 
precipitous drop in cytokines. And I think I was testing 13 different cytokines, you know, 13 of the major ones. You're able to negate inflammatory response in the area. Now, you, you want some inflammatory response because you have to have growth factors stimulated in the production of that. And you need some inflammation in the area to signal that, but you don't want a ton of it, right? And there's really, there's kind of a fine line where you need just enough inflammation, but not too much. So what I was trying to do was kind of balance it out so I can optimize the nexus of those two points. You know, I do that both, uh, like actually here, I'll show you kind of this one of my little daily stashes. So this is neural RX and this is my sort of nootropic version of that. The nanoparticles are bound to uh, caprylic acid because they metabolize in your liver and become beta hydroxybutyrate. And then that gets sucked up to your noggin. That's basically using the body as the mechanism to do all of the the appropriate parsing of the molecules and get them to where they're supposed to go. So that's that wasn't, even though I took that while I was injured, that wasn't the, the component I was using to work on the, the leg. I was using a different thing I have called Olympic serum. And then another one that I made specifically to upregulate stem cell proliferation. And so I would take those two, uh, which, which we jokingly called the prettiest kitty pills. So <laughs> too good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the idea being that cats are so fickle that if you tell a cat one day it's the prettiest kitty and then the next day you go, such a pretty kitty. It goes, yesterday I was the prettiest kitty. What happened? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so so my prettiest kitty pills were to kind of maximize stem cell proliferation. There's actually there's a another company that I, I was taking their stuff to called Stemregen. And I, I like the research there, but it, it's using... Uh, just organic supplements to upregulate stem cell production too. So I kind of did a, a one-two punch on that one. When you were choosing how much of your inflammation to quell, how did you find that sweet spot in between overdoing it and underdoing it? Were you doing like blood work or were you finding it out some other way? Well, some other way, actually. I mean, you can definitely do it via the blood work method. As accurate as that is, uh, I think there are more rapid ways to do it. And a lot of it is if you're oddly in tune with your body, you will see or feel the shift more rapidly than you could actually do the blood work. You know, I mean, it's, it's like working out or being a really good athlete. You know the point at which you're pushing too much because you can feel yourself on the edge of the strain and the collapse. And so you stop at a certain point. I mean, having tested that out in myself to the point of, you know, like pushing myself uh, while working out to the point of breaking, you can very much override where the physical limitations are and what all of the red flags, the cerebral governor theory, right? Where your brain downregulates most everything and tells you to operate within the safe parameters beyond a certain point of, you know, whether it's meditation or just willpower exertion, you can push yourself far past the point at which your body says, stop. And usually that results in something bad. So in this case, I just tried to pay attention. And, you know, like when I could feel the inflammation drop to a point where the pain was manageable, that's kind of when I would back off. I took, they prescribed hydrocodone and I took a couple of the pills, but I tried not to take many. I think over the course of the, you know, the couple of weeks that I was rebuilding everything, I took like six or seven of the pills. And that was just when the pain became unmanageable because I was doing something boneheaded, like trying to walk or bending in the wrong way or doing something silly. And the reason for not doing that was I figured I want to have clarity about what's going on. And so even if there's a pretty intense degree of pain, I'll at least be able to see what's going on with my body rather than totally, you know, blocking proprioception. I'll go the other direction. I'll try and enhance it. So I'm actually pressing and aware and feeling what's really happening physiologically. Yeah. I was talking to Dr. Patrick Porter of BrainTap, and he was mentioning how he has had surgeries without anesthesia by controlling his brain waves and not letting them slip into the beta state. He was able to avoid the pain and do them successfully. Yeah. No, that's totally doable. I One of my uh, really good friends is a fellow named Todd Shipman who does a lot of combo and things like that. There's also a, a thing that you can do with the, the combo ceremony called Sananga, it's almost like putting capsaicin in your eyes. It's kind of like self-administered pepper spray, which which is not, you know, not something that uh, I would recommend people do because it's uh, spicy, definitively the way to go. But Todd always tells the story about when I did it and he was kind of blown away that when I was done, I just hopped up and he said, I didn't think that was possible. I said, what's that? And he said, well, 
you had no change in respiration, your muscles didn't tense, you didn't twitch, nothing happened. And that's the case, but I was approaching it differently. For me, it was an exercise in surrender, you know, which kind of definitely deviates away from the whole, you know, the very staunch scientific approach to things and a more large scale approach for me is last year was kind of a, an interesting period of introspection and transition for me personally. One of the things that I realized in sort of the middle of all of the things that were shifting was I wasn't capable of real full surrender to things. So I had to kind of work on surrendering things. And so I kind of thought, well, that seems like an insanely painful thing. If I'm able to fully surrender, then I should be able to fully surrender all of the emotions, the physical sensations, everything that move in accord with that. And, you know, what better test? So I I called Todd and said, hey, can you do that Sananga thing? And I went to his place and he did it and it worked like a champ, no impact whatsoever. And then I did it again. And it was his, his take was kind of funny that day. He looked at me and I said, well, I think I need to do it again. And he goes, really? Never had anybody asked to do it twice, (laughs) but it was, it was an exercise in surrender because you want to be able to disassociate yourself from all of those physical sensations, you know, kind of fully compartmentalize them so that you, even if you're aware of what's transpiring, you don't equate it as pain. You know, I remember one study I saw a couple years back where they had taken monks that had meditated for, you know, 20 or 30 years, and then a cohort of people who hadn't. And they would play the sound of a baby crying while they were doing fMRIs. And they looked at what transpired in the brain. And what was interesting is for normal folk, we're programmed that when we hear a baby crying, it elicits a very specific response in two portions of our brain. With the monks who meditated, it only happened in the first. So they would get the impulse and it would light up that cortex auditorily. But then instead of having the cascade of you know being pushed into action, they could stop and choose what they wanted to do. So rather than being a reactive sort of creature, it pushes you to a point where you're wholly active. You you get to choose and suddenly you have the capacity and the wherewithal to not go, ah, that's, what, <laughs> that's why, you know, the, the thing you teach people who are going into really tumultuous environments, you don't go like, okay, first thing, panic. You know, it's like, that's, that's, that's the wrong approach. You want to go in calm and collected. And the same thing applies physiologically. You want to make sure that things are smooth and easy and you can kind of roll in without issue. That's an important skill to have and to go in knowing that it's going to get uncomfortable and to be able to, to recognize those feelings come up and let them be present and pass over you. And on the Sananga piece, I had never heard of it until, what was that, maybe three weeks ago. And I joined a men's group here in Austin. Well, not here, but in Austin. And we did a retreat and we had a whole day planned of things ahead of us. And some of us mentioned having difficulties with absolute surrender. And so that was one of the things that came up and we forgot about it because we had other things to do. But that's one that I didn't forget and I haven't done yet. And I've heard that the more you fight it, the more you resist the more painful it is. So eventually everyone comes around to surrendering, to relaxing. When you do that, the pain calms down. Yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, first time I had it was when I was trying to do it for total surrender. So I don't know. I can really provide a good reference having not felt it from the other standpoint. But I will say that in most things and other things that I felt, whether it's, you know, if you're doing martial arts or something like that, and you end up in an uncomfortable position and you you're locked in and you're not able to get yourself out or and there are a whole host of different things in my lifetime that have put me in positions where you feel that both physically, mentally, emotionally, cinching up and bunching down doesn't really help much. It's usually kind of relaxing and letting kind of the fluidity of the thing happen always seems like a better outcome. You know, at least it has been for me. Yeah. And back to the motorcycle accident, because I didn't realize your story behind that. And now I want to dig into that some more. One of the things I was wondering when you were first mentioning it is approach you took, you did a bunch of things to improve the healing and speed it up. But wouldn't you want to set the bone in place first and keep it stationary with something like a cast or as they do in the traditional system with a screw? I suppose if you have to, you have to. But my situation was perhaps a little different than most. I was able to move it back into position without moving it directly. And you can say whether that's decades of meditation allowing you to control all of the musculature and the tension and everything like that. But it, you know, kind of miraculously moved back into the right spot. 
for the average bear, I would say, yeah, hundred percent, you're probably going to need to immobilize it and do something like that. Um, in my case, it was a little different just as fate would have it. I didn't have to do that. It worked out just fine. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing I was thinking about is you mentioned doing your own V cell treatments. How did you learn to do that? And how did you, did you have the supplies there in your lab? You must. Yeah, I, I do. It's actually, it's a relatively straightforward procedure. You just have to have medical grade lasers and centrifuges and a phlebotomist on hand and a doctor to oversee it. And you're pretty, pretty good. It's, it's honestly, it's, here's the thing in my lab, you know, we have a component where we do a lot of applied biochemistry and then chemistry. And we have a full shop for doing welding and, and mechanistic things where my guys right now are finishing up a, a really large hyperbaric chamber. We're constantly doing things. We were just building a, a biochar production unit. We do lots of different things here. There's a whole section where it's just electronics, I'm working on converting my old 1969 pickup to running on water, a different type of fractional uh, distillation of things and separation of things based on resonance. And some of it works, some of it doesn't work. Some of it is fantastic. Some of it fails miserably. You know, a case in point, the deputy director of NASA was down here not too long ago looking at this new gamma ray shielding that I had developed. And it was kind of funny because I thought about how to do it and I figured out what I needed to do. And then I built everything, got all the liquid nitrogen, got everything here. And then we tested it was a hundred percent wrong. It actually up paced it or like it up regulated the, the flow of the gamma rays coming off of the, uh, <laughs> coming off of the material. And so, you know, we were using a big chunk of thorium wrapped in lead so that we'd have a gamma emitter. So I thought, damn, well, that's entirely wrong. So I had to go back and reconfigure everything. I saw what the problem was, but I went back and changed almost diametrically compared to how it was originally, changed things, and then it worked flawlessly. But it was actually kind of handy because then I had a, a gamma ray waveguide in addition to gamma ray shielding and with, you know, with compounds that were infinitely thinner and lighter than lead. But that's the thing. Sometimes things work really well. Sometimes they fail miserably. And in that particular case, failing miserably was actually something that, that honestly, gamma ray waveguide might actually be a better outcome than the shielding. There's a lot of stuff going on around here that we get to play with that I feel kind of lucky, like a kid in a candy store, that I actually get to come in here and do this stuff on the regular because it's kind of ridiculously cool. Yeah. It's beyond ridiculously cool. And I don't think we ever mentioned it, but what's your background? How did you get where you are? I'm overly curious. I pick things up pretty quickly. Memory is something that I was kind of blessed with. A lot of it, I think, just my upbringing, my, my dad was really formative in terms of kind of uh, channeling a lot of my mental capacity. He's a really, truly brilliant guy. He would always give me things that were exercises and challenges and puzzles. And he gave me a book one time on how to increase your genius. There are a lot of people who have done a lot of work on these sorts of things, like in terms of how do you become human 2.0, right? How do you enhance yourself? to do things that other people can't do on the regular. There are lots of different approaches, but for me, it was curiosity, really. Almost everything I've ever done, I, I just didn't understand something. And so in the process of trying to figure it out, I would just keep pulling the thread. And when I was a kid, there, there was a show called Connections. There was this British show from a, a fellow named James Burke produced it on the BBC. It would basically take one concept that we have now or one thing, say like ICBMs or the TV or the telephone or something, and it would trace it all the way back hundreds of years to you know, its inception of how did this thing arrive at being? That was one of the most formative, fascinating things for me because it, it really put things in context where I'd go, oh my God, nobody just arrives at this brilliant idea where it's perfectly formed. What it really is, is technology is building on itself so that as time moves forward and marches on, technology grows and then people take the previous works and, and additively put little components on it. And it's kind of that, the concept of standing on the shoulders of giants. You definitively have to look at all of the things that have come before and then start adding to them, playing with them and tinkering with them. Now, I will say the one caveat to that is that every now and then, I think it's good once you reach a certain point technologically to have open introspection and look at what you're doing and say, okay, great, we've made it to this point, so we're, we're stable, but is this in fact the best way to do it? And I always joke about, you know, why are axles and wheels spaced the way they are? Well, Roman ox carts, right? 
you know, a couple thousand years later, our cars are set up literally based on the dimensions of Roman ox carts. Probably not the most efficient thing. <laughs> In fact, I'll go out on a limb and say not the most efficient thing, but it's because it's been an additive iterative thing that's happened over, you know, in the case of the automobile, about 100 years now. But in the case of that entire construct, over a couple thousand years going from carts to, you know, things that were mobile, that had outside power, then internal power. And if we really stopped and looked at it in that example, looked at a car and said, is this really the best thing? Well, no, we generally drive around by ourselves or with one other person. Yet we have these vehicles that are set up to carry five to six people at a time. They're very heavy. They're made with large pieces of heavy metal. You know, they're not terribly efficient. They're massively thermally wasting. You could revamp all that stuff in a heartbeat with the technology that we have every day now easily. But people don't do it because they're entrenched interests and people are generally reluctant to go back, upset the apple cart too much. And I, and I think that that's actually sort of incumbent upon you beyond a certain point. Technology moves additively to get you to a space where you have a foothold. Once you have that foothold and you're at a different elevation and you can look around, take that perspective and that vantage point that you've been able to get to and then reassess and say, okay, should we change things? That doesn't happen that often. It's uh, evolution is kind of the dominating thing and, and revolution is sort of rare. I think the, the concept of punctuated equilibrium, which is this archaeological concept that things will occasionally move in a, in a linear progression, but then every now and then you have something that takes it up a very massive jump that would be kind of like a five to 10 uh, fold jump in, in the iterative cycle. And that's called punctuated equilibrium. I think the like kind of making ourselves do our own forced punctuated equilibrium would do wonders for society. You know, if we looked at really cars, the educational system, and just looked at simple things, I mean, the way we do education is horrible. Honestly, it's a travesty. A friend of mine, Katie Wells, uh, wellness mama, she has a kind of an unschooling thing that she's been doing that I think is very keen. Uh, one of my friends, Ben Greenfield, you know, homeschools his kids. Those boys, very smart very kind, uh, very well-mannered, and they're pushing the bounds. One of the people that works here in the lab, you know, is studying physics and she was homeschooled and she's freaky brilliant. And I don't think that you normally would find people who like, oh yeah, by the way, I taught myself calculus because I was curious. If they were in public school, they'd have a difficulty with that. You're not really set up to do that. But if the environment is conducive, you know, you can do that. So, and that's just, again, that's one of many things that could use revamping. And I do really feel like our society is blessed. I mean, we have such riches beyond riches at this point that we could pretty much take care of everybody. And if we were willing to be a little more altruistic and try and help a brother out, we could kind of back off and with some objectivity and clarity, look at the dominant overarching systems that govern how our society moves and start to revamp them. Yeah. I think unschooling is a really awesome approach. But then if you start going down that rabbit hole, then you have to question your career and other things that you're doing to make that fit into your schedule. That requires asking a lot of big questions and making some unconventional shifts that might work great. But then you have to explain it to everyone and there's pressure to not do that and a whole other world. Yeah, it is. Well, and that's the thing. But uh, again, you have to be kind of agnostic to, about the outcome of things and willing and be daring enough to pull the thread. Because, you know, maybe if we did that as a species, I, I often worry kind of like the intellectual property way we approach things like, oh, I'm going to hoard this intellectual property where I figured out something really brilliant and not share it with everybody else. Why? Scarcity. That's the impetus for that sort of a decision. It's people either having a scarcity mindset or an avarice mindset. Either they're worried that they'll never have enough or they're geared so that they can never have enough. And it's generally one of those two things. I don't know. I hold out hope for humanity that we're doing things in perhaps a better way. But I do feel like with as blessed as we are as a, as a culture at this point, it would be wise if we backed off a little bit and tried to really assess with a, a degree of accuracy what we're doing collectively as a society and say, okay, can we do this better? Can we help more? Can we change things for the positive you know, outcome that we're really all shooting for? Well, and we've already been chatting for an hour now, and there are so many topics I want to cover with you still, such as your lines of products, because they are innovative, as everything you're doing is. 
and also some stuff around biochar, the other projects you're working on, more on your approach to learning, how you got interested in the Vedas. And we'll save that all for another conversation because there's a lot there to unpack and it could easily be a bunch more hours. So no, I, I'd be happy to. Okay. We'll end with your approach to quantifying quantum technologies and determining what actually works to avoid some of the snake oil out there. And then next time we'll touch on all of those other topics. Okay. That sounds fantastic, man. I, I look very forward to it. So, Me too. Sounds like a plan. So what would you do? How would you go about figuring out what works and what doesn't? Well, the first thing is I'd invest a couple hundred thousand dollars in laboratory equipment. Um, <laughs> so yeah. In lieu of that, look look for the science, right? Sadly, in the past couple of years, that's been kind of obliterated. I believe in science. You're doing it wrong. It's not It's not a belief. It's something that we test. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's funny. Where, where I taught, there was one of the professors had a thing on his, on his wall that said, right when you've walked past, it said, I believe in science. And literally every time I'd walk past that door, I'd kind of go, oh, do you now? You know, that's not, that's not what we're supposed to be doing here. It, it's, it's ironic. To, yeah. It's supposed to not have a damn thing to do with belief in anything. It's supposed to have to do with we're verifying and proving and testing. And that's the sad part there is that's a guy in charge of teaching a lot of people, you know, how to do science. It's definitely, it is kind of ironic. So what I would do in lieu of having the equipment to do it is, Look for things and try and be discerning, right? It's very difficult, actually. I think at some point people will come up with, and I, and I may actually be one of the people to do this, come up with some sort of qualifications or testing for people who are doing quantum things because I want to see data. Like uh, with Leela Quantum, one of the things that I'm happy with is that we've got a litany of data, right? We've tested it, retested it. We have blood work. We have all sorts of stuff, you know, from the BASA Institute in Europe, you know, stuff that I've done at the university here, plenty of things that you can actually definitively prove and show, even though you're not necessarily looking at the quantum technology. One of the things I saw was some guys had a sticker that, you know, you'd put it on and it blocks EMFs. Well, that's actually possible. And I have data that shows that you can do that. I don't have data that shows you that you can do it with a sticker. I mean, I've seen it done with a static piece of metal before that's been altered at a, at a quantum level. But again, where's the science? Show me some blood work. Show me the effects of the EMF. Give me a control group. Well, actually, I try to be skeptical, but not pessimistic, right? So I'm, I'm very skeptical, but I'm very much not pessimistic. I'm kind of a dyed-in-the-wool optimist, but you want to look deeply, right? When people say, oh, it does this ask how, ask why. Unfortunately, you know, with quantum things, there are a lot of things people will ask me like, how does it work? Well, I can't actually tell you exactly how it works. I can tell you what we do to elicit the response. I can tell you what we've done to do it before, but I can't definitively tell you how it works because to the best of my capacity, nobody really knows yet, right? <laughs> we know it does a thing, <laughs> you know? So I guess in, in answer to the question overall, yeah, be skeptical, optimistic, but skeptical. Look at the data, make sure the data makes sense. If it seems completely out of left field, hit me up. I mean, most people, you know, people make fun of me because I actually do this, but at Ian Mitchell one, uh, just send me a direct message on Instagram or something. I it might take me a couple of days to get back to you, but I will definitively get back to every single person because I kind of feel like it's, for me, it's incumbent upon myself to do that because I have a, a sort of skill set that most people don't have. So to share the the knowledge that I've been able to kind of amass on those things, I feel like it's sort of a, a responsibility to do that because a lot of things I'll look at and go, well, that's absolute bullshit right out of the gate. Sorry. You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, now there, there have been times when I'll look at something and think, I don't know how that could possibly work, but I'm still open enough to try it. Even if my initial impulse is skepticism, I'll run it down and test it. Because there have been some things that I've run down and tested that I didn't think were going to work, but yeah, definitively they were working. And then by the same token, there have been quite a few things where, you know, people prattle on about, oh, it's quantum this and that. And you, you test it and go, well, it quantum did nothing. So I'm very quantum sorry that you got quantum right down a berry path. A couple of things I do, I'm, I'm curious if you have any others that if you don't have a $100,000 lab or really any lab at all, I will look at how the devices influence my continuous heart rate variability and then i'll also check my 
brainwaves via an EEG sensor to see if it has any influence there. And of course, it's not placebo controlled. It's not randomized. It has none of the good markers of a clinical trial, but it's a little thing I can do at home. And sometimes I will notice that a device has an effect. And most of the time I notice that they do not. But are there any other like DIY at home experiments you can run? Um, no, actually, those are great. I mean, if you've got an aura ring uh, or an Apple Watch or something like that, and you can look at HRV, that's a huge indicator. HRV is great for that. Also, just your uh, your heart rate. Absolute heart rate is another big indicator because you can see like um, with the Lila Quantum Blocks, I've seen uh, people's heart rate jump 20 BPM just by moving into proximity to one. Yeah. Jump up. Jump up. Yeah. If if they're not, sometimes your nervous system isn't actually at the point uh, where you should be around everything that's, you know, kind of in full force and effect, which is one of those one of those things like in meditation, there's a there's a thing in transcendental meditation, there's a thing called rounding where you'll you'll do for prolonged periods of time, you'll do asanas, you know, your postures, and then your pranayama, the breathing, and then you'll do your meditation. And you'll do that in rounds over and over and over. Oftentimes, I've seen people will try that and it will fry them because they they won't have worked up to it. Or when they work up to it, they stop when they stop immediately, you know, they've built up a capacity to remove a certain amount of stress from their body. And when they stop abruptly, your body still wants to try and get the stress out, but you know, the road is closed. So it's hammering through it. And so it's not really quite up to speed to do that. So the same thing with flowing energy through your system. If you're not really quite at that point, it's problematic. Makes sense. I never thought about elevated heart rate or actually bringing heart rate up could be a good thing. That would make sense. I will break tradition here and I will not ask you the usual questions. We'll save that for next time. But if there's anything you'd like to say to wrap up, are there any things you'd like to leave listeners with? Go out and be nice to each other. Be kind. It's very cheap and easy to do and it has a really pronounced impact. Beautiful. Nice and simple and cheap. Can't get any better than that. It's not as fancy and sexy as some of the other cool biohacks and fancy fringe supplements, but equally needed. Yeah, truly. Yeah, in this day and age, very much so. Well, and this has been a blast. Thank you for joining me today. Excited to do our round two. Yeah, no, I'm really happy to, Nick. That's uh, thanks for thanks for the invitation. So, yeah, I too looking forward to it, and we'll delve into some more of the stuff on round two. Great. Okay. Well, I'm Nick Urban here with Ian Mitchell signing out from MindBodyPeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.